Online Church, Pastor Ed Newton here, and we are kicking off a season of 40 days of prayer and fasting. Today's message is simply the introductory message of why we would fast out of our desperation and dependency for God to show His face personally in our lives, in our families, in our homes, and amongst our nation. We believe it's critical and crucial to ask God, to set our face towards God, repent of sin in our life, and ask God to bring revival in a way that we've never seen it before. And we're doing that across our house, and we're inviting you from wherever you're watching from to be a part of this journey with us. We're going to begin to walk through the Lord's Prayer line by line in the next several weeks to come. We have prayer guides that will be made available to you that we'd love for you to be a part of as you continue to lean in to what God is doing here at Community Bible Church. As we always say this, for such a time as this, God has called us to be together. And so we know that God's going to speak to you. We'd love to hear personally how He reveals His self to you through Scripture and through possibly just a prophetic word that might just land upon your heart. So you can email us at nextsteps at communitybible.com or you can visit us online at communitybible.com backslash next steps. Until we meet again, much love. If you have a Bible, I want you to go ahead and put your pride aside, go to the table of contents because I need you to get a page number on 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Just put your pride aside, go to the table of contents, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. This message I'd like to share this weekend, not only to our Gold Canyon campus, but also our Borgfeld campus. We're seven services, a church in two locations, five services on this campus, two at our Borgfeld location, and those that are at Borgfeld, we love you, we're grateful for you, we're thankful for what God is doing in and through you. For such a time as this, God has called us to be together. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, I want to share a message entitled, Not So fast. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You've looked within, you've looked around, and you have even looked up, and you feel your circumstances are closing in on you. How will you respond? And as we get to Second Chronicles chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, if you're with me this weekend, say amen. We notice in verse 1, the Bible says, after this. That is in Second Chronicles chapter 19, a Revival has broke loose. Reformation has begun. King Jehoshaphat has led this movement of God as they have turned back to the principles of God of purity and seeking passionately his face. But understand, much like in our own personal lives, there is going to be an after this. When you and I seek first the kingdom of God, we will face an after this. What is the after this? It is the fact that King Jehoshaphat receives these new, this news in verse 1. The Moabites, the Ammonites, with them some of the Mennonites, here's what we find out, begin to come against Jehoshaphat for battle. That word battle is not a fist fight. It's not the moments when I was in middle school. I know it's hard for you to imagine, but I was a fighter in middle school. In school, suspension, out of school, suspension. This was B.C. before Christ. And I knew if I was going to get in a scuffle, I had 60 seconds to attempt to win a fight before the coaches and the teachers begin to break it up. Therefore, if I could just do my very best to get as many shots in in 60 seconds, I would have gained the reputation of Ed won the fight. But the word battle is not a 60-second fight. It's a, a daily, a weekly, a monthly strategy of the enemy that has created a coalition these Ammonites, the Mennonites, the Bagelbites, the Micites, Mosquito Bites, all the ites rally together against God's people. The word battle, not a fist fight in a hallway at a local middle school, but the word battle means to crush and to annihilate. But notice in verse 2, then some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from behind the sea, and behold, they are in Hazan, Tamar, that is, in Gedi, then Jehoshaphat was afraid. And I want you to notice, point number one, the attack of the adversary. The attack of the adversary. That is, you'll see the strategy of the enemy that unfolds this way. The enemy surrounds you, this is the first fill in the blank, to create fear. Not only does the enemy surround you to create fear, but the enemy seeks to steal from you to cause failure. And not only does he surround you to create fear, 
steal from you to cause failure, but to slander you so that you would choose to forfeit. I received the news as I walked into the lobby several weekends ago. Sweet couple approached me and said, Pastor Ed, I'm here to get baptized. For those of you that are new to our church, we baptize once a month. Here on this stage, we'll put glorified hot tubs on both sides and and in one song, we'll just bless the name of the Lord as many would say, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. And so this dear brother says, I'm here to get baptized. But that was not the weekend in which we baptized. I said, brother, what's going on? He said, I was going to commit suicide in my car this Wednesday, and God got a hold of my heart. And I'm here to tell you that I've been made new, reborn, and I want everybody to know that Jesus not only physically saved my life, but spiritually changed my life. And at that moment, I said, well, brother, I'd love to baptize you, but we don't have our baptistry tanks out. But if you'd be willing to come to our staff meeting, we would love to baptize you. Now, I'm just telling you, some of you might have worked at a church in the past, and I've worked at several in coming to Community Bible Church, but I've never been a part of a staff meeting where we have a baptism in the staff meeting. But all of a sudden, this dear brother just says to our staff, may everybody know that the enemy does not seek just to irritate you or frustrate you. The enemy seeks to kill you and destroy you, and I'm the product of that attack. May we not forget that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but God came to give us life, and no weapon formed against you shall prosper because the blood of Jesus has declared us as sons and daughters of God. And the enemy has no right upon you. See, the enemy cannot steal your soul when you belong to Jesus, but he'll do everything he can to discourage you, defeat you, disconnect you, and cause you to be distraught and depressed in serving God. Because here's what happens. All those who desire to be godly will face persecution. We will face tribulation. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So what must we do? As we understand the attack of the adversary. Point number two, I'll need you to notice the advantage of the Almighty. Notice what Jehoshaphat did in verse 3. In verse 3, the Bible says he was afraid, but in that fear. See, God did not give you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, a sound mind. That is the power of the resurrection that raised Jesus from the dead. Is the power we have actively at work in us. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who has declared us as his own. But notice what Jehoshaphat, as the leader of God's people, called and rallied the nation of Israel to do. And that is, he set his face to seek the Lord. The word set does not mean to glance at, but to gaze at. We glance at road signs but we gaze at mountains that do not move. And therefore, God has called us as the people of God, not to glance at him, but to gaze at him, to see and behold his beauty. Think about this. The enemy begins to encompass the nation of Israel. The geographical reference points is to say they are almost here. But King Jehoshaphat did not strategize. He did not scheme. He didn't call his military leaders together. But instead he sought the face of God. And then he proclaimed a fast. A fast. In 2017, to deprive our bodies of anything does not make any sense at all. We have said this before, our bodies are temples, but oftentimes we treat them as if they're amusement parks. We say yes to every craving and feeling that surfaces in our soul. And to do without makes no logical sense, but we find out from the Scripture that fasting is something we see throughout the pages of God's Word. What is fasting? It's a process in which to eliminate clutter in the life of a Christian by choosing to abstain from a daily dependency and redirect that need to God through worship, scripture, reading, and prayer. Why fast, you might ask today? As we see through the pattern of scripture, we see David fast for his son that was sick. Out of desperation, David fasted. 
It's out of dependency that Moses fasted as he longed to hear the word of God. It's out of discernment that Daniel, as he has been given the decree that you cannot pray towards your God, he began to fast. It's out of deliverance, Esther prophetically used of God to bring about the preservation of the nation of Israel against a wicked individual known as Haman. God used Esther. She declared a fast. You also find out in Scripture, 1 Kings 19, Elijah finds himself in the bottom of depression, and it's in that moment he seeks direction. It's out of fasting that the nation of Nineveh, as they receive the word of God from Jonah, that that king declares a fast because God said, if you do not repent and turn, disaster will come upon your land. And Jesus fasted. If there's any reason to fast for anything in our life, it's because Jesus gave us that example. I am asking us as the people of God here at Community Bible Church, could we declare in faith that we want the year 2017 to be unlike any other year we've experienced in our life. We have to get to the place where we're tired of our addictions. We're tired of our bitterness. We're tired of our criticism and caustic nature. We gotta be tired of our depression. We gotta be tired of the fact that we lack endurance. We gotta be tired that we're harboring forgiveness upon someone that needs it. We gotta be tired of our guilt. We gotta be tired of the way things have been and ask for God to do something supernatural. But if God's people would turn their face from their wicked ways and look to God, God would show out and pour out his grace and mercy. And I'm asking us as the people of God in 2017, as long as God allows me to have breath in my lungs as the pastor of Community Bible Church, we will begin every year fasting Asking God to do something we can't do for ourselves. And that's where we're going. You say, Pastor Ed, I've never heard anybody talk about fasting. Neither did I. But Bible is in our middle name. And as we look to the pages of the Bible, I believe there's some people in this room that need a breakthrough. That need a miracle. And could we go away from something in the next 40 days. I'm not asking you to fast from food for 40 days. If the Holy Spirit of God says that to you, you make sure you consult your physician before you do that. There's a lot of medical situations around that, but you and I are saturated by a lot of things in our world that creates clutter. And could we pick something specifically that for the next season that we have, that I'll go away from this so that I could seek the face of God over something that I need a breakthrough in and for. It could be media. It could be movies. It could be your iPod for our young people. It can't be your homework, young people, all right? But as we look at our lives, for some it might be the entirety of the 40 days. For some it might be one day for the next several weeks. You choose that. Let the Holy Spirit of God say that to you. But what would it look like if we as the people of God said, we need you. We long for you. If there's ever a reason to fast and pray and seek God's face, would it not be for the unity of our nation? Would it not be for revival in our land? Would it not be for God to do something in our families? To save my son who needs Jesus. For somebody in the room, it might be a prodigal that needs to come home. And could we pray, fast and pray and ask God to do what only he could do? So King Jehoshaphat led the people of God and proclaimed a fast. Not only did he proclaim a fast, but he prayed in faith. Notice these words, and I won't read through the entirety of all these verses, but in verse 6, Jehoshaphat began to pray. And notice this, O Lord God. Of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. Verse 9, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you. 
And for your name is in this house. And we cry out to you in our affliction. And we and you will hear and save. Notice verse 11. Behold, they, that is the enemy, rewards us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given to us as an inheritance. He goes on to say in verse 12, For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us, and we do not know what to do. Oh, this is a word for us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. They're on you, God. But I want you to notice in this prayer are some anchors for their faith. That is, Jehoshaphat confessed his power. He counted on his provision. He called for his peace. He claimed his promise. In the next several days, a part of our series, we will look at the Lord's Prayer verse by verse through our season of fasting and positioning and posturing our heart before God as we hunger for Him. But we will also pray specifically in our lobby area. Maybe you received this when you walked in. We have put together a prayer guide for you. We ask that you would engage in that. If you not received one of those, they'll be in the lobby on your way out, both campuses. And so we'll begin our fast on January 16th. That is Next Monday, not this coming Monday, but the following Monday. And we will ask God to do what he can only do. But we will plead before him. But we will understand this. In our praying, we are not manipulating God. We cannot twist his arm to do anything. But in faith, what we're saying is this. God, you are power. God, you are protection. God, you are provision. God, you are my everything, and I will set my face to you because I need a word, I need a miracle, I need a breakthrough. Could it be for your business that God desires for you to fast and pray for? Could it be for your coworkers? Could it be for your family? Could it be for that medical issue? I led a group of teenagers. I was doing this event in Bentonville, Bentonville Arkansas, which is Walmart country, and I would go one Wednesday a month, and the assistant there at that church her name was Janet, and she was diagnosed with cancer. 300 teenagers fasted for 30 days from something, begging for God's healing. One day, Janet grabbed a microphone and said, through all the chemotherapy, I've had no appetite for anything, but for today, I long for some ice cream. It is all of a sudden, she began to feel the power of prayer. What does it mean to pray in faith? If we were to pray for rain, we would be the people of God. If we're going to have a prayer rally and we're asking God to pour out rain in the drought, we would be such faith-filled people. We would walk into this room knowing we're going to pray for God to break the drought and bring rain. We would be such faith-filled people that we would walk into this place, yes, on the drought on the outside, but knowing that we believe God was going to do something because he hears our prayers, we would have walked into this room in faith carrying umbrellas. Did you catch that? That we would live in such a way that we would be faith-filled people longing for God to do a work. But not only did King Jehoshaphat proclaim a fast, not only did he pray in faith, but he also praised in the fight. Notice this. It's in verse 13. The Bible says, meanwhile. Now, on the count of three, can we say the word meanwhile together? One, two, three. You go, so why did we just say that? Because in the midst of all of that, there was a transition. There was an interruption. That is, a fast was decreed and declared. And King Jehoshaphat began to pray these things, calling out and confessing his power, provision, peace, and promise. God, he was saying... Do it once more. Defeat the enemies that surround me. And all of a sudden, there was a meanwhile. And that is, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones and their wives and their children. And the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit is not just in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit is all over the Old Testament. And the Spirit of the Lord descended on a man by the name of Jehaziel. And we don't know who he is, which is why his Facebook profile had to go this way. 
Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. He had to have that lengthy of an introduction because all of a sudden in the sacred assembly, this individual known as a prophet begins to say, I got a word. May you and I in these days as we proclaim this fast, as we believe in faith and pray, could we praise in the fight that God wants to speak to us, that God wants to give us a word, that we would tune our ears. And the reason why I highlight this is because the word of God may come from the least likely of places. But that's why we fast. So we can learn, and I want you to hear me, so we can learn to hear the voice of God outside of this room. Because when the voice of God speaks to you in your Toyota Tundra, come on, or that Volkswagen Jetta, or that Dodge Sundance with 190,000 miles on it, praise God, Scott Kendig, that God would speak a word and you would know that I've met with God. And here's what will happen. You'll taste and see the God of this universe in a very personal, real way that will forever alter your life, your family, your business. But notice this. As the enemy continues to move, notice what the prophet said in verse 15. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God. Notice in verse 17, you will not need to fight in this battle. Stay firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed. Tomorrow Go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. And notice what happens. King Jehoshaphat rallies up the worshipers and says this to them in verse 21. And he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in a holy attire. Let's just call that the choir robes. They didn't put on the armor. They had no weapon but the praise from their lips. May we understand the way we wage war against the principalities and the demonic forces is that we do not fight with the weapons of this world, but because of our praise off our lips in the midst of the fight, what we realize is that the battle is not ours, but God is calling us to engage in the battle, to not sit in coziness and casualness, but to aggressively step into the battle in our holy attire, which is our righteousness through Jesus Christ, who says that we're sons and daughters of God, who has proclaimed a prom come on, let's have some church up in here, that proclaimed a promise over us that all things work together for good to those who love him and call it according to his purpose. So I will step into the storms of my life and I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord who gives and takes away. And what you'll realize is this. When you and I begin to proclaim his praise, notice what happens. When they, verse 22, when they began to sing and praise the Lord, the Lord set an ambush against the men of all the ites. He, don't miss this, in faith, we have to take a step into the battle. The battle's not ours. The battle belongs to the Lord, but in faith, we step into the battle and we proclaim his goodness. But in faith that is activated, what we're saying is, God, you're the victory, you're the salvation, you're my shield, you are my song, and I believe if you could save me, you can do it once more, God, against the enemies that surround me to take everything that you have given me. So we will not forfeit what God has given us as as our promised land. We will not operate in fear. We will not operate in failure, for he's got plans.
plans for you, not to harm you, but to make you successful in his promise that this is true, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But let it be through our praise that we realize that the battle is won. So on January 16th, we'll proclaim a fast. Next weekend, I ask that you would come to the house of God ready for that one thing, to be dedicated before the Lord. It's voluntary. I'm not going to force you to do this. We do not fast to tweak the arm of God or twist the arm of God. We're fasting and praying because we believe that God has a will and a desire. And we're saying, God, we want that. The kingdom of heaven has to come now. And that's where we're going as a church. And we're asking for exponential blessing, privately, personally, corporately, in your businesses, in your lives. God, pour out your blessing. And I'll close with this. I was at a fast food restaurant, and I noticed that my kids were in the playground, but there was this little boy that began to come across the cargo net and put his hands on my daughters. So allow me to refer to him as the creepy boy for just a second. The reason why I would say that is because that's what my daughters would call him. As they said, Dad, can you do something about the creepy boy? So I just said, hey, listen, let's just pack our stuff up. No need to create confusion or chaos in the playground. I, if that parent is not going to do anything, I have no authority to say anything. So let's just go to the house. We'll come back another day. All of a sudden, my three daughters and my son said, Dad, just a little bit more time and they had a strategy. We'll just go to the other side of the playground, and if he comes on that side, we'll go to the other side. We'll just we'll work around him. And as I sat at that table looking through the glass, I began to watch this little boy make his way towards my daughter. It was at that moment, I was waiting for them to move, but all of a sudden he startled one of my daughters, and he wasn't trying to be malicious. He was just friendly, overly friendly, especially of a dad of three daughters. And all of a sudden, in that moment, I kicked my chair out from underneath me, rushed into the playground, and began to point through that little cargo net and said, boy, get your hands off my daughter right now. Boys and girls began to come down those slides, grabbing their shoes because they've been taught in school. Somebody does something like that. That's called stranger danger, and you need to get out. So now it was just my children and the boy that was frozen trying to put his hands on the shoulders of my little girl. As I confronted him, it was in that, that moment that his eyes were large. He was startled. All of a sudden, I just said to the young man, and no need to send me an email about losing my cool. I, I've already repented before Jesus, so just everybody understand. Lord probably didn't handle that the best way. Should have been a little bit more cordial, not so salty as I addressed the issue. We get in the car, waiting for a thank you. You ever been there? I adjust the rearview mirror, just waiting. Continued on. Finally, I just called out one of my daughters, and I just said, are you not going to say thank you? She goes, Dad, that was so embarrassing. And I probably didn't handle this the right way either. I said, let me tell you something. You just need to know your daddy will always fight for you. I will always fight for you. You go, Pastor Ed, how old was she? Six. Probably didn't connect. But the spirit of a living God just spoke in my heart. Ed, tell the people, I'll always fight for them. Tell them, when the life that you live begins to get entangled by the cargo net and you feel like the enemy is about to come after you, not equating the little boy with the enemy, don't misunderstand, but when the enemy comes and tries to steal, kill, and destroy, may you know that you've got a heavenly father that kicks the chair of his throne and begins to unleash a... a divine interruption the angels but most of all King Jesus that fights for his children 
could we consecrate a fast beginning January 16th going, God, more of you, less of us. We want to be a church, and I want you to listen to me. We want to be a church that turns the whole world upside down. And listen to me. In order for to be a church that's going to turn the whole world upside down, we've got to do some things that a lot of churches don't do, which means we consecrate a fast because we're that serious. It's not our programs. It's, it's not our stuff. It's the spirit of a living God that we are saying we need you because in and of ourselves we will utterly fail but little as much when God is in it could we just simply say to you God we need you and we just seek first the kingdom of God and will we not experience blessing and yes we will go through tragedy but there will be a peace that sustains us in the midst of it all let's stand together if you don't mind all across our campuses with heads bowed eyes closed there's a promise for all of us in this room to take home and to process. But for somebody in this room that has not put their faith and trust in Jesus, it begins by you no longer trusting in yourself, no longer trusting in religion, but choosing to put your faith and trust in Jesus and make Him the captain of your salvation. So with heads bowed, eyes closed today, if you seek to settle this issue once and for all, to turn from your sin, to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. This prayer is not a magical formula. This prayer is a confession of your heart that you want Jesus to save you and change you. And if that's your desire, would you just say this to him and mean it from the depth of your heart? Because it's more about your heart than anything else. Say this to him, Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect. But I believe you died for me. And right now, I'm asking you to save me, change me. I give you my life. For those of you that prayed that prayer in faith for the very first time, whether you're at the Borgfield campus, online, or here at our Gold Canyon campus, if that's the decision that you just made, we want you to understand it's the greatest decision of your life. And all of heaven rejoices for just one, but there might be more than one that made that decision. If that's the decision you made to give your life to Jesus Christ today, would you just raise your hand as tall as you can as you are standing there? Hold it up so I can see you. I do not seek to embarrass you, but if we cannot stand up for Jesus in here, we cannot stand up for Jesus outside of here. It would be difficult to do that, but we just want to encourage you. So today, if you prayed in faith, I want you to look at me. You can put your hand down, but you received a tear-off portion. A lot of people put their prayer requests, their needs, their desires to volunteer or to get into a group. They just use that as a communication card. But could that be your communication card that you would use to let us know that you gave your life to Jesus? Somebody this week's going to call you and tell you how proud we are of you. But right here across our campuses, we want to tell you how proud we are of you right now. So let's put our hands together. Borgfield, Gold Canyon, let's celebrate.